Well, I'm excited. I, I was, uh, had the opportunity last week to preach to our association, our Flint Hills Association. And so I got to preach to a whole group of people that don't know me. And I started it with just telling them that I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a dork. Like I kind of get excited about things and I say things wrong. And I was just sitting there thinking as I was telling them that I don't even have to tell you guys that no more. You just know. Like I, I'm the Beth Fuge. I was going to call it like Beth Pedge or something weird. And I had to Google it to make sure. But so you guys just know that. But I hope that you guys um, are excited about what God's doing. Uh, we had a, a ton of visitors um, last week and uh we're praying that we continue to see not just visitors, but we see people who plug in for the mission. I, that song that we just sung, uh, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. I don't know if you guys walk around much or when, when you're out, that if, you, if, you're, if you're looking and you're seeing the brokenness that, that exists here in Iola. You, you don't have to go to the city. You don't have to go anywhere. You, you can find brokenness right here in Iola, people that, that greatly and desperately need a Savior to intervene for them. And, and, and we are the church. We, we have the answer um, to, to all the world's problems. We, 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 as Christians, we, we're not waiting on the White House to solve our problems. We believe that the Bible has the prescription that we need. And, and that's exciting. It's exciting that, that Easter is, is such a wonderful time that we get to invite people to come and hear about the resurrection of Jesus. It'd be a real sad story if, if there was no resurrection that took place. Um, but so I don't know if you're like me. I, I can go anywhere and I can miss everything. I, I could probably walk past you in Walmart and be in my own mind trying to remember whatever my wife told me to get. And I feel like they rearrange Walmart every time I go. Like nothing is ever in the same place. Like she'll say it's the same place it was last. No, you don't understand it, man. When, when you're not here, they move everything. Now, when you ladies show back up, they put it all back where it was last time. But for us men, they move it. Like milk is usually what? In the back left of the store. That's what my wife says. No, when she's not there, it's in the like front right. I don't know what they do. And so I'm walking around trying to find stuff and I miss a lot of things. And I think it's easy to get distracted and start to miss things. Like we were at a concert yesterday and Hudson leans over to Amanda and says, I got to go to the bathroom. Now music's blaring. There's, we're focusing on everything that's taking place. And so she, okay, we're in, a, we're in like a Coliseum little thing. And there, there's thousands of people. Well, all of a sudden Hudson disappears. Not like magician, but like he's gone. Luckily, Jennifer wasn't distracted because she leans over to Amanda and said, uh, Hudson just left by himself. <laughs> Amanda springs up. She doesn't even tell me. And she, she like goes looking for him. And I'm like the guy, like probably look like I'm at Walmart just looking for something. I'm just standing there like a big dummy like, huh, where, where'd she go? <laughs> and Jennifer's doing like the motherly thing. Like she's telling Aaron, I got to go help find Hudson. I'm like, I should probably help find Hudson. But I was distracted. She was distracted. She missed it. One time I was on a bike ride, and I'm riding behind this guy, and a deer jumped over him. It was crazy. It was the craziest thing I ever seen was, was literally from, from me to Barbie away, this guy on a bike gets a deer, jumps right over him. The only thing had been cooler if he, if he would have got kicked and like it would have been even a cooler story, but he didn't get kicked. But I lean over to the guy, not lean over, I look over at the guy beside me and I said, oh my goodness, did you see that? And he's kind of like, what? See what? Because he, he was looking down and he missed it all. And I'm like, no, you got to get this. A deer jumped over this guy. And it sounds made up when you're telling the story. He's like, okay. <laughs> and I'm thinking about kicking him off his bike because I was telling the truth. And, but he didn't believe it. But have you ever missed something? Like, just missed it. Like, you're, you're, you're going, you're walking. Here's, here's my week. This is how my week goes. You get up, you, you've, you've got bills to make sure they're paid. You, you've got to make sure kids got the, the things they need to get. Uh, cook dinner. I don't cook dinner. I don't do any of that thing. But my wife, she's making sure we've got food for the week. There's all these things. Work, all these things. So you start checking off the boxes. You check off the box. You get to the end of the day, and you do what? You go, oh, that was a long day. And if you're not careful, you can look back and you can miss the, the sweet moments with your kids, the, the conversations you could have on the way to school. You, you could miss the, the ball games because of work. You, you could miss it all because you're just going through life and you've got this head down mentality. Now, you guys probably believe in multitasking. Like everyone, you can multitask. Let's do two to three to four things at once. This is what Harvard says. Harvard's just people who believe to be smarter than us. They say multitasking is near impossible. 
That you, you, you're either fully focused on something or you've just divided your attention and you become less effective. They say that you, you're effective as much as 40%. So you, you're, you're, you're now less effective, but, but as humans, we want to go through life and we want to do as much, as often as we can, and so we'll go through and we just start to miss things. This is why it matters. Today's text is this. Today's text is, is about Jesus going into Jerusalem, and this is what can happen. That they're going to miss it. Some of them are going to miss what's taking place. He, he's going to say it, but if we're not careful, we'll miss it. We'll, we'll miss it that this is King Jesus that's riding on the back of a donkey. We'll miss it that, that King Jesus, the same Jesus that we read about in the text, that, that the Bible says that one day he's going to return. And that every person that's confessed him as Lord and Savior, that, that, that they get the right to be sons and daughters of God. And that they'll inherit eternal life. But if you miss it, the Bible says that for those who don't know, that they'll suffer eternity in hell. And we'll go all through life and we'll get too busy and we'll miss it. So this is, this is where we're at. We're in Luke chapter 19, and we're going to be in verses 28, and we're going to go all the way through verse 44. But I'm just going to, to read, and you guys just try to, try to follow along. It starts off, when he said these sayings, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and, and Bethany at the place called Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples. Now, if you remember last week, we were in, talking about Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel sounds a lot better than Mount of Olives. I was just saying, Carmel is a much more uh, tasty thing. If you enjoy olives, that's okay. But Mount of Olives. And he told them, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter, you'll find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, that the Lord needs it. And so this is what's going on. He, he just teaches a parable. And, and then he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to the city. Now, this is, this is a big deal that, that he's going to the city because John 11 tells us that, that when, they find who Jesus, when they find Jesus, they're going to arrest him. It, it says, if anyone knows who he is, let us know because we want to, we want to deal with him. Steve made point to it that, that up to this point, up to right now, that, that Jesus is a very popular guy. Everyone was attracted to his teaching. He, he taught like no other. If you were hungry, Jesus was feeding them by the thousands. If you were sick, he was able to heal you. If you, were, if you were lame, he was able to help you to walk. This Jesus guy, up until this point, is a very popular guy. But right now is like a, a twist in the story because he's going to the city and he's not going to get new boots. He's going with a divine purpose. Jesus is going to do business. And so he's coming to town. And this is the cool thing. You would think if he's going to town and they want to arrest him, where are you going to come? Where would you go? Well, if they want to arrest me, guess I'm not coming through the front door. Like, I'm going to try to sneak in. I don't want them to know I'm here. But no, what we're going to see in this story is Jesus is coming to town, and he's going to march right through the front gate because he's got a divine purpose for why he's showing up. But before he gets there, he needs to get his ride. He, he, can't, he can't go walking in, so he, he sends two of his disciples, and he says, go and get this. It says, Colt, uh, the other uh, gospels tell us that it's, it's a donkey. It's a, it's a young donkey. It says, go get it. It's never been rode on, nothing. It's never been yoked together, and that matters because in the Old Testament, that the, the donkeys that were never yoked or never been ridden on, they were able to be used for a divine purpose. They could be used for, for something special. They were set apart. And so, so Jesus says, hey, go get it. And, of course, you guys that own animals, if you look out and someone's taking your animal, you're going to, hey, what are you, where are you going with that? And this says owners, which is unique because this is a pretty cheap animal for the time, but it's, it's owned by multiple people, which lets us know that where he's going and getting it, it's probably someone that's broke, and they're willing to give it up for the Lord. He says, tell them the Lord needs it, and they let him have it. That's unique to think about. And so, so they go and they, they, they get this, this colt for Jesus to ride on. And then we, they bring it back to Jesus in verse 35. And they, they bring it to him. They throw their clothes on him. They make him a saddle. And then they help Jesus get onto this colt. And as he goes, they start spreading their clothes on the road. The other evangelists, that's why we have palm branches, it says that, 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 that they start spreading these, these palm branches on the road. They're, they're, they're making a, a triumphal carpet for Jesus to go into Jerusalem. Second Kings 9.13 says, Each man took his garment and put it under Jehu on, on the bare steps. They blew the ram's horn and proclaimed Jehu is king. They're, they're rolling out the red carpet because this Jesus guy is not just some, some random guy. This, this is King Jesus that's coming into Jerusalem to, to do business. Luke 9 is going on in verse 37. says, He comes near the path down to Mount Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples begins to praise God joyfully. 
with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. They're, they, they, they're thinking about the things Jesus has done. They're, they're thinking about the, the lame that he caused to walk, the blind that he caused to see. Or caused to see. They're probably thinking about Lazarus that, that he called and, and Lazarus came out of the grave. They're sitting there, they're looking at Jesus and they're recalling all these stories. The stories you and I can recall. And this is where it leads them to a place. It leads them to a place where they start to praise God joyfully. I don't know about you guys, I, I love to sing. I can't sing good. I'm not saying people love to hear me sing, but I, I love to sing. It's, it's amazing that we have the, the, the availability and the ability to praise God through songs for everything that he's done. And my prayer for you guys is when you're singing the songs, it's not just about the words. It's not about performance, but it's about praising a God who's done these things for us. It's about praising a God that, that saved you from your sins. That's why we have worship. It's not because we, we think that our, our praise team is some amazing team and that we're trying to get them a record deal or something. We, we have them up here just to Praise God for what he's done. If you don't like it, that's okay. But we pray that you like who we're singing about. We pray that you're worshiping God through songs. That's, I love that, that. We've got pretty good spectrum of music. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. that we've, we've got this genre, and then we've got this genre. And some of you guys are probably thinking, well, I like this kind. Well, there's all kinds of different kinds of music. The time it becomes bad is when it quits worshiping God. We, we, we could, we're, we're going to. At this old time revival, we're, we're going to do some southern gospel style music. Uh, I mean, if, if we may see a ukulele come out. I don't know what we're going to do. That's not a real instrument, what I said. Ukulele. That's a real instrument, ain't it? Ukulele. No, it went downhill. Instrument. Just say that word. Just inst- we're going to have instrument. No, but seriously, uh, we, we, we're willing to, to, to put out any style of music as long as it proclaims that Jesus is who he is. As long as it brings glory to the Father. Outside of that, it's, it's all preference. And so they, they think of this. And they think of the prophecy that's being fulfilled. And they start to, to praise out to who Jesus is. <laughs> Him riding in, they're probably thinking about this. Uh, this is something that, that I, I believe uh, points forward to, to Jesus. That, that whenever Adonai is trying to become king... And he's going around and he's, he's making these sacrifices and he's trying to establish his own kingdom. But that's not the king that God had to be in place. It, this is 1 Kings one thirty three says this. The king said to him, take my servants with you, my son. And have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. And, and, and this, this is a picture that this man riding on, on the back of this donkey is, is who the king is. And I believe that they knew this story. That they're, they're seeing now it's the king showing up on the back of a donkey. Zechariah's prophecy also pointed to this, and if you were watching the video, it made note to it, but it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout and triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. This is King Jesus showing up. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to thank Barbie if I was there. I wouldn't miss missed it. I like, to, I like to think as the story goes on that I wouldn't have been the one that was crying out, give me Barabbas. But I think when I'm honest with myself, I think I would have been. I think if we're honest with ourselves, that we would have been the same ones who were, were praising him here on, on Palm Sunday. But, but come the day of the, the crucifixion, we would have been saying, crucify him. But they get it here. They stop and they reflect. And verse 38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest on heaven. They're overwhelmed with it. They're crying out, this is king. This is Jesus. This is the, this is the prophesied Messiah that's been sent by God. This is him. Hosanna. Hosanna. Some of the Pharisees, though, they're, they're hanging around and, and, and from the crowd, and they, they tell them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answers, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, stones would cry out. The Pharisee says, in the nicest way, just can you tell them to shut up? They're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, this is the king, this is the king. Tell, tell them, just keep it quiet. If they'll just keep it, we, we don't want the, the, the Romans to hear about it. We don't want you guys causing a mug. Just... just and honestly, could we just bring them through the back door? They don't, they don't want an issue to take place. So they say, hey, can you just shut your disciples up? And, and Jesus says these words. If they said nothing, the rocks would cry out. 
The rocks would cry out, Hosanna. The rocks would cry out, this is God. Habakkuk 2.11 says, For the stones will cry out from the wall, and the rafters will answer them from the woodwork. And so this is Jesus coming in. This, this triumphant entry is taking place. And then in verse 41, it says, Jesus approaches the city. And, and, and you, you might be thinking, like, he's, he's, he's going to be holding his hand up in victory, that he, he's going to be celebrating. But the, the text tells us that he, he's approaching it, and he wept, saying, if you knew this day would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. They missed it. They, they, they don't understand what Jesus is doing. They, they believe that this is, this is Jesus, this is the Messiah coming in, but they believe that his purpose is greatly different than what his purpose is. They believe that he's going to give them political refugee, that he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. They, they believe that this Jesus guy is going to get them out from the, the pressure of Rome. That's what they see Jesus, and that's what they see in Jesus. says, you've, you've missed it. And so he begins to cry. They don't know that the Jerusalem people do not understand what true peace comes from. And so he says in verse 43 and 44 that the days will come when your enemies will build up a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Jesus just describes just a typical way that a city is, is put under siege in this day. That they would, they would build up these barricades so that they could come over the wall. And then when they get over the wall, guess what they do? They, well, they're not coming to, to greet you and tell you about the good news. They're, they're coming to kill and they're coming to and, and so these people, they're looking at Jesus and they say, Here, here's our Savior. We're, we're going to be kings again, if you would use that sense. And Jesus says, you, you've missed it. I'm bringing peace, but not the kind of peace that you're thinking about. True peace is peace when you're, you're, in, in, you're, in, you're in cahoots with God, when you're, when you're walking with God. You have peace that, that your enemies are going to come and they're going to destroy you, but that's not going to undo what I did. I've still come to usher in peace. I've still come to usher in kingdom. But worldly peace and, and worldly freedom is not what Jesus offers. And so the enemy sits up their hub that it talks about, and when they would do it, they would sit at this little hub, and that would be like their command center, and then they, they would launch into the city, and they'd overthrow it. And these people that are hearing this, they have all these revelations from God up to this point, that this Messiah is coming, this prophecy that, that's going to be fulfilled, and, and they're seeing it take place, and they have all the Old Testament scripture, and the evidence that God's shown them time and time and time and time again. They, they miss what Jesus is really showing up to do. So here's a couple things I want you to take away from, from this story. The first one that I think is important to capture is that Jesus is a right deserves joy. That Jesus had been drawing people into him with, with, with this, this, these mighty ways that he would teach. I mean, Jesus was the best preacher that there's ever been. Jesus spoke with authority like no other. When, when, when Jesus spoke, it, it was the word as if it was from God directly because Jesus was God. He is God. And so all these crowds are following him. And they want to see the stuff. That, 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 that's what's so electric about, about when God starts working, when God's spirit starts moving. They, you, these walls couldn't contain when, when God's spirit moves in a mighty way. Now, there's no replicating it. There's this saying that uh, don't try to conjure up what only God can bring down. That, that's what uh, the risk is at church is that we want to see God move in our midst and, and we're willing to, to, to maybe employ any, any ethical way that we could. If you would ask me, would, would you juggle to share Jesus with someone? I'd juggle to sing to share Jesus. I would sing if I thought someone would listen to me to tell them about Jesus. And so we'll try anything to, to get the gospel out. But the risk is that we try to start conjuring up what only God's spirit can bring down. And so that these people here, when Jesus shows up, he deserves to be greeted with joy. When they hear he's come into town, they should be excited. Jesus' name, when you, when you would have said it up to this point, it would have caused people to get excited. If you heard someone talking about Jesus, you may start thinking about your friend that's, that's sick or your friend that needs something. You may say, I could take him to Jesus. If I could just get my friend close enough to Jesus, man, maybe he'd be even crazy enough. They'd be willing to cut a hole in a ceiling to lower him down. 
That's, that's, that's Jesus. Maybe if I could just get close enough, Mike, to touch the hem of his garment, he could heal me. That's Jesus. And so when they hear Jesus is coming to town, they're excited. And so they rush out. I wish we would do that. I wish we would get excited and desire the Lord's presence in our life. That, that parents would be excited for the opportunity to get their kids under the word of God. That we would be excited as, as families to just have the opportunity to sit down and, and open the word of God at our dinner tables. And just, just dive into what God says. How do you guys receive Jesus? How, how's Jesus truly received with you? Uh, is he greeted as a king? Is this King Jesus we talk about? Or, or do you truly dread it when you hear about him? When you think about them, are you joyful? Does, does hearing the name of Jesus bring you joy, or is it just kind of blah? You're kind of just indifferent to it. <laughs> I wrote down that the, the, the king is, is, is showing up, but for some reason, some of us look like we're waiting to get into dentist appointments. It's like we just dread being here at times. We just dread being under the world. Of God. This would be the most exciting times of our week that, that believers are able to gather together and to worship King Jesus. But time and time we get more excited about sports teams and political stuff than we do Jesus. And so how do you receive King Jesus? In this story, he's received with joy, um, but we'll, we'll see that it doesn't stay joyful. Um, and you guys know the story. It doesn't stay joyful. They start to chant, crucify him, crucify him. But another thing we see is that when Jesus arrives, it's preceded by his betrayal. I don't know how many times my, my prayer is, Lord, that you would move in our church, that you would move in Iola, that, that, that we would see lost come to know you, that, that you would move in such a way that, that there would be no confusion, that, that your spirit is alive and is active and it is moving. Um, and that really should be the prayer of any, any pastor that, that pastors a church, uh, that, that God would move. It should be really the prayer of any church member that, that God would move. Um, there's this saying... Uh, Sayings, uh, if, if you pray, if you want the applause of heaven, be, you must be ready for the assault of hell. That, that when God starts moving, Satan's going to take wind of it and he's going to start moving. That's why, that's why churches are, are, are one of the first places that, that disunity and stuff takes place is because when, when God's moving, Satan's moving. And if God's spirit's going to move in a mighty way, it must be the people who are ready for it. And, and, and this here, this is the mark, this is the end in this story of, of Jesus' public approval as we know that from this moment forward, the, the Roman government, the disciples, everyone's going to start jumping ship as it goes on. That's, is, am I cutting out? I'll just keep talking while. <laughs> As Jesus is, is sweating blood in the garden, we're going to see that his, his disciples are sleeping. As Jesus is carrying the cross, where, where's all the people when he's carrying the cross and, and he's fatigued and his back is ripped open and, and he's hurting? Where, where are all the people that were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, to, to help pick up the cross and carry it? I don't know. Who, there's a couple of them who are in the story, but which one jumps out and says, hey, I'll help them. That's, that's the king right there. I'll help carry his cross. No, Simon. Simon from, from Cyrene has to be voluntold to carry the cross. Where were the enthusiastic disciples who proclaimed this, this is the king? They're nowhere to be found. We, we, we talked about the, a couple weeks ago about, about where was Peter at when, when Jesus is being... A, he, he's getting shook by some little, little girl that was there to open doors. When, weren't you with him? No, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. But we see that Peter denies him. And here's what I, th I believe in. I think we see this all the time. Jesus is good when it's good. That's the best time Jesus is good. But when it's not good, I don't think some of us believe that Jesus is good anymore. Whenever hard times come, whenever it seems like maybe we can't make it anymore, uh, that Jesus ceases to be good. And, and all the times in our, in our church does this, does this take place, that, that people show up and, and they're, they're excited about Jesus and, and something changes, where, where by, by, by Friday they're, they're chaining crucify him. They want nothing to do with him. That, that it goes from excitement to just crucify him. We must not take heed and get caught up in this, this parade mentality that when it's good, it's good. I'll tell you this, that, that Jesus is King Jesus no matter what your circumstance is. 
Uh, John Piper has a video where he's talking about the, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, which is a lie from, from hell. And he, he says this. He, he says, when is the last time that, that someone ever saw how good your God is by the new BMW you drove? I never had a new BMW. But I, I, I agree with the sentiment of it, that, that there, is, there is nothing worldly that points to how good God is. When it's good, of course, if people, oh, man, God's good. But he said, what makes God good is that whenever your, your car goes slamming in to the concrete wall and your daughter flies out and she falls like dead on the pavement and through the most de deepest and, and hurt you conjure up, you say, man, God's still a good God. Though this hurts, though I don't know what tomorrow holds, that I don't know what my, what's going to happen with my daughter, that, that God is still a good God. That's who Jesus is. He, he's still a good God, whether things are going good for you right now, whether you like your job. The truth is, maybe you don't even like your spouse right now, that Jesus is still King Jesus. But for some reason, we get caught up in this parade mentality. But the truth is, it's a parade's always going to end. And you've got to ask yourself, who is King Jesus to you? Who is riding in on the back of a donkey for you? Is it just someone to, to, that you can chant Hosanna when it's good and the crowds love it? Or is this King Jesus no matter where the parade's going to stop at? But also notice that his arrival was accompanied by tears. Jesus weeps because he knows the condition of the people. Same reason I believe he, he weeped whenever, he, whenever we saw him with, with Lazarus at the tomb, that he saw the effects of the sin on the world, and it brought him to cry that, that Jesus here knows what the people are wanting. And he knows that, that he, they've had the revealed word of God, that they're even standing now in the presence of Jesus, and they miss it, and he begins to weep. He explained the mission to the disciples over and over, and they still continued to miss it. You know, we, we as Americans, even outside of Americans, we're going to miss it. Like, we're we're going to get caught up and in, 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 in play in church so much that, that we're going to miss King Jesus riding in on the back of a donkey. None of this is about us. And, and, and you, you, you know why he's even going to Jerusalem? Like, why, why, would, he, why would he risk it? If the mission is just to tell people about Jesus, like, like, or tell them about himself, wouldn't he be better off to go somewhere they don't want to kill him? Like, like why not get outside of the emperor of, of Rome where, where he could go and tell someone that doesn't want to kill him? No, you know why he goes? Because it's only the message of Jesus Christ that can save him. He, he, he's going because he knows where the parade ends at. He, he's going because he knows that he, he has to stand in our place. He has to take the lashes upon his back. He, he has to take the nails in his hand. He must be hoisted up in front where, where, where everyone would see him in his shame, where he would sit there and struggle to breathe until he breathed his last breath. He's got to go to Jerusalem. He, he's he's got to go. They've, they've got to take his body and they've got to place him in the tomb. He, he's got to go. But, but why? Why has he got to go? For us. That's why he went. So, so that he could make payment for our sins. He, he never did a thing wrong. The list of things I've done wrong are, are so long I couldn't start to, to tell you about them. If you knew half the things I've probably done wrong, you probably wouldn't talk to me. The truth is I'm a, I'm a sinner. I, I, before Jesus saved my life, I deserved hell. I still deserve it. But he was graceful enough and he showed me his mercy. But he had to go. He, he had to go so that the work of the salvation could be completed. When he's hanging on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's done. And he goes. And it just gets me wondering that, 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 that he sits there and, and he weeps about it. Jesus weeps looking at him, knowing that, that they're going to miss it. And then, then I think about us and I think about when's the last time we wept for a lost person? Or when's the, when's the last time that I looked out at the world and knew for sure that this person's going to go to hell to a place where it brought me to tears? I get it as men, we may be, oh, I don't cry, I'm a man. Maybe you should cry. Maybe knowing the fact that, that the people that you say you love are going to spend eternity in hell should, should bring you to your knees where you would cry. I'll tell you, it's, 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 it's got to be partly a shame that, that every Sunday that we're not just down here just pleading with God that you would move in the life of my family, that you would move in the life of my neighbor, that, Lord, without you, without you going to Jerusalem, they'd spend eternity in hell. But we sit there and we're just waiting for the dentist to come out and work on our teeth when we've got an open altar for, to do business with the Lord. And we say, I'm not going to go. It's awkward. They're going to look at me. Uh, do I got that picture, BJ? 
BJ, I'm going to put BJ to sleep already. I got a picture somewhere in there, BJ. This is a picture. I love this picture. You guys know people, one of the persons in this. This is Frank. You guys remember Frank? He came and did revival. Frank barely walking anymore. Both his knees are bad. He's got his cane. That's Chad Pentagraph. He's just, he, he tell you, he's just ignorance for the Lord. He just loves Jesus. He's down in Oklahoma. He just preached a message that was just knock your socks off good. And then sitting over here praying with, with Frank is, is Robert. This is, this is a guy who was 19 years old in, in college and getting drunk and had, had losing his scholarship, never known anyone to love him. And Frank said, hey, let me, make, let me take you in and, and I'll help raise you. I'll, I'll, I'll be a dad to you. And so Robert calls Frank dad still to this day. And I pick on Robert all the time. Like, dude, you were 19 when he, he adopted you. Like, that's, but, but it's a beautiful picture. But this is what's going on. Frank was broken over his heart just saying, hey, I don't, Want, I don't want to move sometimes. I want things to die. And Frank's gotten older, and you know what the risk is? Even at 34, sometimes I'm like, I don't want to move. I want it to be my way. And so I watched Frank sit his, sit his cane down, and he, he came up to the altar, and he can't even bend his knees very good. He had to fall forward and catch himself on, on that bar. Probably hard to see right there. There's a, there's a handrail right there. He catches himself on it. And he can't even bend his knees. He's just kind of half bent because it gets in too much pain to bend his knees. And, and then he, he, he sits there on there and prays. And his, his adopted son goes down and, and prays over him. And Frank, when he's done praying, doesn't want no help getting up. He pushes himself as hard as he could. I thought the whole stage was going to push over him. And, and he gets up and he's hanging on to that handrail. And he's just sitting there shaking. And he goes back to his seat. To dinner with Frank that night. And I said, I said how are you doing? And I'm, I'm telling you, I took mental note to this. I took a picture of it, not just a mental note. I said, I said, what were you praying about? None of my business, but I just love to hear when the Lord's working on Frank's heart because it's, 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 it's beautiful. And so he tells me about it. And, you know, at that moment when I was sitting there, I was thinking about you guys, actually. I, I was thinking about you all. How good was that of me? I'm, I'm here listening to these sermons. The Lord's supposed to be working on me, and I'm doing that thing. Like, man, they need to do This is a good message. They need to hear that. And I was asking myself, Lord, why, why is it that the church doesn't come down to your altar? Is it like, is my sermon's not good? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they're not. I'll say weird things. Lord, are you, are you not moving in? The, like, what is going on? And the Lord told me, Travis, you didn't even want to go down. Like, you, you sat in your chair and you watched it unfold. Why didn't you go down? And I felt so convicted about it. And I said, Lord, would you, would you break my heart? In such a way that I no longer care about who's looking, what's going on. That, Lord, I, I believe 100% without you moving in the life of those people that don't know you, they'll spend eternity in hell. And why should I give a rip what people around me think? That I should be willing, like, like Frank was, to, to go and just fall forward at the altar. And there is nothing special about this altar, but there is something special about being willing and being vulnerable to come fall on your face at the altar and just cry out to the Lord that he would intervene. And so Jesus goes to Jerusalem because it's the only way. And I wonder, are, 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 are we willing to even get out of our seats at time to cry out for those who are lost? Jesus was willing to hang on the cross in their place. What are you willing to? And I, I think the problem is, is, is that we miss it. We, just, we either miss it completely or we just miss how broken we are. So here's a question. Who's your one? I told you we were going to bring up who's your one as many times as the Lord laid it on my heart. I'm 100% convinced that there's people in your life that are going to die and go to hell. That there's people that, that if they were to, to get in a car wreck going to work tomorrow morning, or if they were to have a, a heart attack tonight and they were to not wake up tomorrow, that, that you know people today that would spend eternity in hell. It should break our heart to know that. If you truly believe what the Bible says, that there's no second chances there, there's not a you get down there and there's some, some lottery that's taking place that maybe by happenstance you may get out. No, it, we, we believe that the Bible teaches that hell is a place of permanency. 
that when you breathe your last breath, you're found in one of two places. You're either found bathed in the blood of Jesus, that he is your Savior, that you trusted in him, that you've turned and you repented, and you said, you are Lord of my life. I recognize that you are King Jesus. You're either there or you're on the other side. And the other side's got a lot of options. It could be that you're just un unsure, you you've not trusted, but at the end of the day, what it boils down to is this, that you don't believe that Jesus is King. You don't believe that Jesus is King in a way that you're willing to give up the kingship of your life and say, hey, I trust him. He is Lord. He is Savior. And I trust everything that I've got to him. Here's the good news. You can do that and you don't have to have it all figured out. That's a beautiful picture about walking with Jesus, that, that when you go from, from there to over here, that the only thing that truly changes is the condition of your heart. The Bible says that the Spirit will come and live in you, and it will start to change you. But those are the only two places, death or life. And I believe that you have people in your life right now that are on both sides. But the scary part is those who are in death, if they breathe their last breath, they'll spend eternity in hell. When's the last time that's broken you? It may be kids that you have. It may be your neighbor. It could be your family member. It could be your own mother. It could be a cousin. But the truth is this. If you believe in the hell that the Bible teaches about, then that should break your heart to know that they'll spend eternity there. It should break your heart enough that you'd come down and you'd be willing to cry out that the Lord would intervene. There's nothing you can do or say to make them go from death to life. But there is a God who you can cry out to that spirit will draw them. So when's the last time? So his arrival demands a response from you. That's what Palm Sunday represents. That the king is coming and that you must respond. You, 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 your your non-response is a response. And so here's a couple thoughts and then I'll, I'll, I'll close very shortly. We almost brush over it real quick. The Lord needs a donkey. And so he, he tells the disciples, go and get it. And I believe what's taking place is something that's already been orchestrated. I don't think Jesus is strong-arming these people out of their donkey. And because he says the Lord needs it, and those people say, okay, we'll give it up for the Lord. What do you have that the Lord needs? And we, you can run to, the Lord don't need nothing I have. I, I get that. The, 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 the Lord truly doesn't need anything that, that, that we have. He needs our availability. But, but the truth is this. The, the Lord has given you time. He's given you talent. He's given you resources that you could use for the mission that, that God has. And, and so what, what do you have that, that the Lord may need? I, 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 could, I could go through a long list of, of things in this church that, that, we, that we need. Teams that need filled. The truth is this. I don't, I don't, I don't care really about a lot of that. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for men and women who are fired up about what God's done in their life. Hey, we're, we're not looking to put names down on paper. I, that, sometimes that's the sales pitch. Hey, we're short in evangelism. We'd love to put your name down as the number two person on this team. For what? Just so your name's on there? No, what, what, what we want is people who just say, man, I'm so fired up that God saved me. Can you point me in the right direction? And they're like a rabid dog. They just need pointed in the right direction and told just sick them. And they want to go and tell people about Jesus. That's what we're looking for. There's people who are fired up, wound up about what God done in his life. And so what, what do you have right now? What, what do you have that God needs to use? I'll tell you, it's not all glorious and it's not all fun. And it won't be all that you want it to be. But I'll tell you that the Lord is looking for people to sign up who says, that's King Jesus, and I'm ready to go. Luke 19, 40 says, he answers, I tell you, if the rocks were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. Has the world silenced you? I prayed a lot about that this week, preparing this. Lord, where, where have I been silent where I shouldn't have been silent? Where, where, where have I felt the pressure of maybe just going by to get by or didn't want to feel awkward? Lord, where, where, where have I been silent when I shouldn't have been silent? And I, and I pray this, that, Lord, I would never let a rock take my place. That, that I would be a willing vessel that would cry out, this is King Jesus, no matter what it costs me. No matter if it cost me my friends, no matter if it cost me my family, no matter if it cost me my position, no matter what it cost me, that, that it would be King Jesus 100% of the time, all the way. And so I wonder, what has the world silenced you on? And so this is a king coming. And so here's the challenge. I'll invite Steve and them up. Uh, we're going to have the, the moment of, of the, 
the altar call, a time of response, a time to come and cry. But, but here's the challenge. I, I believe this about Easter. Easter is one of the easiest times to invite people to church. Uh, almost so much so that I, I believe this. I believe your lost friends and family, if they know you're a Christian and they know anything about Easter, they're expecting you to invite them. I, I, I truly believe that, that most lost people are, are crying out for an answer and they're just looking for it and they're looking for someone who would say, hey, I know the answer, would you come? And so that's why Easter, that's why we're making a big deal about it, not just because it's, it's Easter. We, we, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. We're making Easter a bigger deal for you guys to even have a, a better chance to invite someone. Hey, I know you guys got three young kids. We're having an Easter egg hunt. Would you like to come to church with me Sunday? Hey, uh, we're, we're, silly thing, but we're having an Easter photo booth where we're going to take your photo. And, and would you join me? Would you be willing to come? Easter is one of the easiest times to invite someone. We've, we've made these cool little little gifts for, for visitors that if they fill out the Connect card that we're, we're going to take to them and we're going to make contact with them and just say, hey, loved having you. What do you believe about Jesus? We'd love to see you again. That's what we're, that's what we're doing about Easter. And I, so I believe it's one of the easiest times to invite someone. We made these, these invite cards. I think they're beautiful. I didn't design them. I had a, a, my buddy design them. They say all the stuff. You, you, you don't even have to say anything. You can just be awkward and just throw it at them when you drive past them. I don't know how you want to do it. But I'm telling you this. There's 250 of these. And I'll tell you, just the people in this room, if, if you truly are serious, if you believe that without Jesus they're going to die in the hell, take one of these. Take it to them. I promise you this. I'm going to show up ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ next Sunday. I may not say all the words right. I may stutter. I may stammer. I may get excited enough. I miss the first step when I come down for the altar call. I can't promise you, but I'll promise you this. The gospel will be preached. That if someone doesn't know Jesus, they will know how to go from lost to life. They'll know how to go from death to life, from lost to found. That's the promise I give you. The photo booth may fall apart. The Easter egg may, egg may get canceled because it may rain. I don't know that, but I promise you this. If you take this and you'll invite your lost friend or your lost family to church next Sunday, they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only promise I got for you. So take this. Pray about it. Lord, who would you have me give this to? Who, who do you want to invite? This is what we're thinking about doing. This is not, this is, I'm not even trying to pressure you into it. We're thinking about taking the back row out of the pews, or the chairs. Give, give some more walking space. We need to stretch our legs. Because we look out and the chairs are empty, we know that we could push you guys forward. But how good would it be for this Sunday, this Easter, to say, man, we got to pull more chairs out. we got, we got to cramp them in a little more. My pay doesn't change. I get nothing. I hope you guys understand about my heart. I do not care about the pay. I do not care about filling seats just to fill seats. But I'm telling you, your friends, your family, they're going to go to hell unless you tell them about Jesus. And so Easter, let's do it. Let's make a promise to, to between us and the Lord. Lord, I'm going to be faithful this week. I'm going to invite one person to Easter service. And then just start praying, God, that you would move in their heart. Let's pray. Father, Lord. You're such a good God. Lord, we, we celebrate that, that today marks the day in history that you are riding in on the back of a donkey. Lord, as a king. Lord, we know how the story plays out. Lord, that they started chanting, crucify you. Lord, and you were put to death so that we could have life. And we praise you for that. Lord, I pray for those who are sitting in this room. Lord, if they don't know that to be true, that, that your spirit would be drawing them. Lord, that your spirit would be moving in their life right now, that they would know you as King Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who do know you. Lord, that you would just put a burden on their heart right now for somebody that doesn't know you, that they could invite to Easter service. Lord, we know that doesn't mean they're going to say yes. Lord, but we, be, we want to pray for those conversations right now. Lord, that the, tomorrow or next Easter or Sunday, that your name would be proclaimed, that your message would go out. Lord, and people would pass from death to life. Lord, we love you. All these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys would stand.